My name's Chris Top. I'm a blacksmith. I've been a blacksmith for over 30 years in North Yorkshire, Carlton Hustwit, not far from Coxwold, that famous village. I'm going to make a hinge, and this is a bar of wrought iron which in itself has had a previous life because this was made from a piece of ship's anchor chain. And I'm heating the metal in order to soften it. And very soon I'll be cooling it down again. What do blacksmiths do? Well, blacksmiths make things out of metal, but more uh, to the point, they make things out of metal when it's hot. So everybody knows that a blacksmith hits metal. Well, what does he do when he hits the metal? He's distorting it. He's pushing it around. Think of it as plasticine. The metal gets more and more white, the hotter it gets. So the closer to white heat you are, the hotter you are. We have to do it hot so that the metal's soft enough. Well, the traditional metal of the blacksmith, and what blacksmiths have used since time immemorial, is wrought iron. And this is a metal which really has been replaced nowadays by steel, but I still use the wrought iron because I'm very keen on it as a material. The historical continuity is one reason I get a lot of pleasure out of doing the job in the way that it's been done for the last few thousand years. I like it because it's very durable, as we'll see later in the church. Uh, there's metal there which has been there for 400 years and basically still doing its job and that's a characteristic of wrought iron that modern metals don't have so if I want my work to last forever that's the material I use. Well blacksmithing exists on a lot of different levels from very large work like the anchor chains of ships for instance or in fact the anchors of ships right down until jewellery almost, little catches for little boxes and that sort of thing, locksmithing or the whole range in between. What we normally get involved with of course is doing things like making gates or um, balustrades for staircases or hinges for doors. Very nearly always the need for the metalwork is a functional one but we do try and put our own little artistic touches into it because it shows that we have pride in our work. Blacksmiths were very, very common at one time. Even a, a small hamlet would probably have its uh, blacksmith. Every farm would have its own blacksmith. Every big estate would have probably a few blacksmiths. And I suppose the most familiar thing that blacksmiths would have been doing in those days was putting shoes on horses, making shoes and putting shoes on horses. But at the same time, they'd also be using the same techniques and materials to do maintenance on buildings, uh, putting railings up, uh, making hinges and catches for doors and windows, putting tyres on carts, you name it, if it was made of metal, the uh, blacksmith did it. Over the years we've worked in many churches, churches are usually stuffed with ironwork, uh, and it's a bit of a privileged place to work because the ironwork in a church is likely to be there in four or five hundred years' time. So um, we're going to have a look at uh, St Michael's Church at Coxwell today to look for examples of ironwork within the church and say something about them. So we've come to talk about ironwork. And the first thing we come to in the church is the hinges on the door. Well, the first thing we notice about the door is that these four boards are a great deal older than the rest of the door. And they're evidently being gnarled and worn by time. I've got a great story to tell. And part of the story is in the nail holes because they're all covered in nails. And we can only speculate about what was nailed onto this door. 
in the past. But of course the nails are the work of the blacksmith, so the blacksmith's there in the background just the same. Uh, and there's a great big gash across here which might have been made by a sword or an axe or something. And while we're on the subject, the, uh, all of these weapons, of course, are the uh, work of the blacksmith. The hinges are nailed onto the door. They're evidently very ancient hinges. They're not going to tell us how old they are. Uh, and to a large extent, it's difficult to tell because the work of the blacksmith never changed over ages. So let's have a look at what the uh, inside of the door has to tell us. <coughs> well, from the metalworking point of view, uh, it's all held together with nails. And these are very ancient nails. Um, and they're what's called clenched nails because they've been driven through in order to hold the ironwork on the hinges, for instance. And then they've been bent over. And actually you need a pretty decent iron to do that. In, in the, the, some a lot of the old iron was very brittle and you couldn't use brittle iron if you were going to clench the nails over. The actual hinge pintle here, which must be very ancient because it's built into the fabric of the church, is incredibly worn. It's lost about three quarters of an inch off there over the centuries. The hinge itself isn't as worn, so that makes you think, doesn't it? So what happens when in another 500 years, when the hinge wears through altogether, I don't know, but I don't suppose I'll be here to solve the problem. Let's go and have a look at a part of the church that's usually not accessible to the public. They we're using the very ancient key and the very ancient lock to open the very ancient door. We're going to go to the clock chamber and then we're going to go up further and have a look at the bells. Here we are up in the bells, in what is called the hursting, the framework that supports the bells. And uh, nice to see that this is an original timber one. In fact, it's got a date on it, 1601. And of course, there are some bits of iron that I can find in here, uh, which are probably contemporary with the uh, hearse framing. But the interesting thing for me about these bits of iron is that they've obviously seen a life before this. So when the smith has put this brace on to doubtless strengthen the corner of the hearse frame, and there's many of them everywhere you look, uh, he's not gone and used an uh, expensive piece of uh, new iron, he's used something that's had a life before, as you can see by these holes here. And it's probably a piece of cart tire. In modern parlance we call that recycling, but the smiths have always done it because Iron was historically a very expensive commodity and uh, the smith had the ability to make it go again. So can we speculate on the date? Here it says 1601. Is the iron dated to 1601? In which case, that piece of iron probably had a life of a hundred years before it ever got to the church. And uh, as ever, there's a story to be told. Ooh, you bang your head everywhere in here, don't you? And uh, finally, up this rather interesting ladder and through the tiny little hatch into the daylight on the roof to have a look at the weather vane, which has also been here for hundreds of years. Well, I do know something about this weather vane because uh, years ago it snapped off and we were asked to uh, repair it and put a new uh, mounting or a jaw. So the original vein is very old and as you can see it's quite corroded but the bottom bit is um, uh, quite new really. We did repair this, um, I suppose it must be 20 years ago now and when we did it we used the same materials, we used the same methods as had been used to make the thing how long ago, don't know, 100 years ago, 150, 200 years ago, it could be any of those dates. Uh, and uh, in a large, to a large extent that's what drives me as a blacksmith is this sense of continuity of doing things in the old manner um, and paying respect really to the old smiths and to the old uh, ironwork by doing that. 
So uh, we've had a good look at the church and we've found lots of the bits of ironwork, some of them so small that they would probably pass people's notice, but have a look at them more closely. Go to your own church, go and see what, where the blacksmith has been and what the blacksmith has done. That'll have to do.